Are men the oppressors of women, or are women the oppressors of men? A woman wakes up in the morning in a house built by men. She starts the water to boil on a stove built by men, and sits at a chair and table put there by men to read a newspaper written in part by women, but printed and delivered by men. She nibbles some toast made from grains grown and harvested by men. Whoops! Time to take a shower. She turns a faucet handle installed by a man, and lo and behold, out comes hot water, delivered by a vastly complicated water system, built and maintained by men. She drives to work in a car built by men, on roads built by men, powered by petroleum, drilled and refined and delivered by men. She arrives at an office building built by men, walks to her desk, fires up her computer, and glances out her window at a city built by men, full of potential customers for her service business. Out of the corner of her eye, a table in the conference room that seems awkwardly out of place snags her attention. She strokes her earlobe. At that moment, the janitor scoots by in the hallway. Bob, oh Bob, could you please move that table further into the corner? You're such a dear. She pins him with a delectable and utterly phony smile. Bob, oblivious to the cheapness of the words and falseness of the smile, thrilled to get any attention at all from such an attractive person, pitches right in, and as he lugs one corner of the heavy table across the carpet, she exhales a comfortable sigh. Her day has begun. She will spend the next eight to ten hours telling other people what to do. That's her understanding of work. This creature, who has no idea where things come from, how they are made, and has not the slightest knowledge about how the world works, has been put in charge of it because there is really nothing else of any specific value she could be doing. If she lived in a world built by women, she would be sitting in a tent, watching her breath in front of her face, stitching animal hides. But she lives in a world built almost entirely by men. And amazingly, she has not the slightest appreciation or gratitude for that fact. She never even stops to think about it. Never stops to think that if all the things men make and do were magically removed, right now she would be plodding through a muddy swamp looking for red-winged blackbird eggs. She thinks the world is made out of proper grammar and attractive clothing and polite conversation and correct opinions instead of rivets and concrete and copper and petroleum. From the day she picked up her first teaspoon, she has been learning how to manipulate the things men provide as if they were put in front of her by God or Mother Nature. She has no idea what men actually do. Yet, according to her and the media she consumes, men are assholes. How long do you think this is going to last? When I think of the men, the lumberjacks and truck drivers and paper mill workers and printers, and delivery men, the men who have to get up early every morning and do very hard jobs, so that Ellen Goodman and Maureen Dowd and other feminist blowhards can sit in their climate-controlled offices, shitting out editorials 
about what assholes men are, when I think of those women walking on the backs of all those men, I want to start bombing things. Let's bomb them all the way back to the unheated tent and the muddy swamp and see what they complain about then. Maybe they'll start writing editorials about how women should start doing real work, not just office work. Here are the facts. 19 out of 20 people who die on the job are men. 4 out of 5 suicides are men. 85% of the homeless are men. Women live 7 years longer than men. 65% of America's wealth is owned by women, says Forbes magazine. Men are not regarded as equal parents to their children. Men are drafted in time of war and women are not. Given these facts, how could anyone with half a brain possibly believe that men are the oppressors of women? Now hear this. Men are now and always have been the protectors and providers for women. The protectors and providers for women.